Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Bigfoot Notes from the Field. I'm your host, William Jebning. I have uh, Jay and TW on this evening. They are both regional directors for the JRG, Jay for the Southeast, TW is for the Southwest. Going to discuss, as we brought up at the end of last week's show, some of the vindictive kinds of behaviors that Sasquatches seem to exhibit. I was going to do a little research and try to dig up some of that, but... You know, when you start getting into some of those accounts, and I have tons of them, uh, it gets to be a little daunting. I mean, it's it's one of those things, you know, you do is for book research because you make notes and you spend a lot of time doing it. But I only had a couple hours to work with in the past few days, so I didn't do it. So we'll start off with that, and, uh, you know, wherever the conversation leads is where it leads. That's sort of the way this show works. So, fellows, welcome this evening. Uh, Hi. Yeah, good evening. Now, I know, Jay, you've actually studied some of the uh, the primate behaviors and done some comparative anthropology. And, and TW, you have too, basically, since you're in college currently taking some coursework. I guess let's kind of talk about some of those things. I mean, we mentioned last week about using comparative anthropology, and I think that's very important. It's something you kind of have to do if you don't know much about an unknown species or an unrecognized species, but you know kind of the basic family they belong to. Sasquatch is obviously a primate. You know, everything that constitutes what a primate is, the Sasquatch has. So uh, it's not that's not even a question. They're, they're definitely in the primate family. So we can reasonably assume that they're going to have similar to behaviors to other primate species. Well, you... first of all, I'd like to start by saying that I'm, I'm not an anthropologist or a biologist, so <laughs> that I that I read a lot. So uh, yeah, I've uh, I think the closest that that we could get, you know, without actually having, you know, something to study, you know, in front of us, which we all kind of wish we did, uh, at, at our own uh, under our own conditions, is to to look at ourselves and then look at primates you know the closest that we can find and figure out what those behavior traits are um i mean if you're if you're a purist in science they say you know use of anthropometric uh language or anthropomorphic i mean uh language or or uh, an approach is taboo you know that you should be looking at at strictly studying behaviors uh and not trying to superimpose you know, human emotion or intent or thought or anything like that on whatever you're going to study. Um, on the flip side of that coin, it's also been written that if we don't impart some sort of empathy to the subject that you're studying, then, then you lose the ability to learn about it and yourself. I, I think there's a fair amount of information out there already that suggests, um, I mean, we could coldly uh, look at monkeys and apes and and orangutans and things like that and say, you know, while they look a lot like us, so those similarities, you know, demand that they have um, thoughts and ideas and cares or emotions like we do. Um, but we but we already have observed some of those things with, with great apes and with, you know, uh, chimps in particular, where we know, and, and I think this goes back to um, some maybe primal instinct, but uh, they've studied chimps in the wild and in, in captivity and shown that, you know, when they're begging for food, they, they do that with an open palm. There's been times when they would bare their teeth and hold their hand out, which, you know, we see that behavior in human beings. You know, we ask for things, we reach out, we put our open hand out, hey, give me this, you know, those types of things. Uh, they've seen uh, female chimps um, shaking their head left to right, side to side, and, and imposing uh, a negative emotion or, or it's when, you know, they're trying to tell a little one, don't climb that tree, you know, or they're doing something that, that we perceive they don't want them to do, uh, you know, maybe approaching a male that's agitated or something, and they've seen them shaking their head. So, you know, is that where we get that from? You know, it's not a learned behavior from them watching us when they study them and they see them doing this in the wild. So, you know, there's some things that I think you could draw some natural comparisons to. Yeah, I think the difference thing, between. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, that's all right. I was just going to say one. You know, the fundamental question everybody says is, you know, where they come from? Are they apes? Are they not? You know, we say they're primates. Well, we're primates. You know, by by the definition of the word. So, uh, if you look at what are the differences that that separate us from great apes and chimps, 
you know, when it's already known that, you know, 97, 98% of our uh, mitochondrial DNA matches, there's only, what, a, a percent and a half left that's, that differs, there are still differences. So what what we think we understand based on, on you know, everybody that has, this is anecdotal reporting, unless you've, you know, had one screaming at you in the night or you've seen one or come face-to-face with it, you know, like TW, uh, I haven't, I don't know if I would call the benefit of seeing one myself yet, but, you know. <laughs> you've been screamed at, though. <laughs> but I, I, I can tell you, I about crap my pants when this thing was screaming at me, and I had a pretty good indication of what the heck it was, uh, you know, as it's stomping away and everything. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't, anybody that knows me knows that it doesn't, I'm, you don't have to convince me. I know this is real. You know, this is, uh, you know, uh, to a lot of people, mythological creatures that they don't even want to get their mind around. I think there's some very primal things going on inside themselves where we have a fear of monsters. You know, we, we don't want to see things, think about things walking around our house at night that could rip your arms off and beat you to death or, you know, break, break through the you know window and grab you out of your vehicle or whatever. And, you know, we don't want to think about those things, so we don't. We dismiss it. We put it in a box. But I think if you look at at great apes and primates and chimps and you look at, at their morphology, uh, what makes them like they are and what makes us like we are, these, these fall squarely in between those two. I mean, they really do. You yeah, know, morphology so. is what, what actually differentiates what different species are. In other words, if you take a look at the horse family, you know, you've got, you know, mules and zebras and all kinds of things that are different species, but they all fall within that same family. The same with primates. These guys, they have the same general makeup that all primates have, so that puts them, because it's based on morphology, squarely into the primate family. But I think when it comes to, there's a differentiation between, um, you know, uh, anthropomorphism and comparative anthropology. Anthropomorphism, you're right, that's placing human emotions, thoughts, all these kinds of things on a non-human species, whereas, you know, comparative anthropology looks at, they say, okay, we've got this this creature over here that's not recognized, but we're getting a lot of information, a lot of these reports, which, you know, TW is a police officer, you know, knows that that's trace evidence. It is anecdotal, but it's also trace evidence. Uh, when you look what's in those accounts, the behaviors, and you take that information to look and see with other primate species, let's say, you know, we, the Sasquatch, someone said it did A, B, and C. And you take a look at gorillas, and the, we find that there is A, B, and C behavior there. We look at chimps, there's A, B, and C behavior. I think it's fair to say at that point that's not anthropomorphism. That's, that's comparative anthropology because we can assume since multiple other primate species do A, B, and C, and it was reported, let's say multiple unrelated witnesses with the Sasquatch, that A, B, and C was reported. I, th- I think yeah. that's a reasonable comparison. Well, you know, anthropomorphism says, you know, this is why they're doing this, or, or interpreting something that, like, you know, we smile, we bare our teeth. You know, if they're showing their teeth, that's probably not a good thing. <laughs> right, know? that's a challenge. <laughs> so, so that's the problem: is is how far we go with that, and what our interpretations of those that behavior is. And oftentimes, people misinterpret. Uh, there's there's been a lot of uh, things written about gifting and the problems with gifting. Huh. And you mm-hmm. know, experienced this with monkeys in uh, China uh, right now, where where you know it's become a habit for tourists to go up there and carry things. Bag burglar is what they call these monkeys now because they're very aggressive. So they'll they'll look cute and they'll do the begging gesture because they've been conditioned to do that. But then they steal, you know. So they go right to okay, I'm close enough, and then they take whatever they can get. So you know where where the the real response for uh, that human interaction, which there probably shouldn't be anyway, but is to dominate. You know, it's right. so dominance and, and, you know, not offer anything, but, you know, so they're... Or shoo them away uh, or something, you know. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very fine line when people, you know, I hear about all these, you know, 
folks who, who these things are you know, passive and, you know, we don't have any problems right. with everything. That subgroup you're dealing with may not right That's now. making an assumption. Exactly. And and here's a here's a direct correlation. And TW, you can relate to this because you've actually had an experience with this with these uh, these gentlemen that you've had contact with. Where uh-huh. and, and it's something that's said pretty often. Where when people leave things out for these things, and then it stops, they get very aggressive. They get pissy. Which they get pissy. So Jay, that's something you know we've seen. Like you've seen this. You read this about with uh, these monkeys in China. The Sasquatch, that's a comparative anthropology, you know, a direct correlation, you know, where we see what happens. It's not just, you know, in China with, I mean, you can look in other parts of the world, South America. Uh, I mean, had grizzlies and, and black bears in Yellowstone got conditioned to people giving them food. And when they weren't getting it, they started pulling doors off cars and, and getting very aggressive and violent. Uh, and we And we hear stories of this all the time with the Sasquatch whether food is being left out and then all of a sudden it isn't available or they're leaving food out for these things and it stops, then they get very aggressive. Yeah, or they've heard about where there's a garden that they frequent. And here's one thing that I learned about primates that I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking about. And it's, the, it's one, when you get a differentiation between human behavior and, and primate behavior, grade eight. Uh, you know, hum, humans have homesteads. And even if we're considered nomadic, we still carry our home with us, a tent, camper, right. you know, stuff like that. We do that. Great apes don't. They, they don't have a home. They're, they're always moving around. They're always building small nests Absolutely. and things. So, so they, <clears throat> they remember where the food sources are. They remember to, you know, what types of food sources, when things are in bloom, fruit, you know, different things like that, and, and when to go to these areas. So... You know, my question for you would, uh, Will, would be, you know, how do you see these groups uh, bonding together? Because that's one of the cultural questions I have because, you know, even even chimps have culture. And, you know, people might laugh at that or whatever, but, um, you know, we know chimps are smart. We know great apes are smart. We know there have been, uh, you know, apes or primates in captivity that have learned up to 100 uh sign language, you know, words and sign language and gestures, uh, they're aware enough to even uh, be able to combine symbols that they were taught when they see something new, like there was a, a female chimp that saw a swan and the first time said water bird, sign for water mm-hmm. bird, you know, so there, there's more intellect there than I think we probably want to allude to, even in the wild. Well, uh, Jane Goodall makes that analogy. Oh, definitely. She, I mean, a lot of mainstream science does not like Jane Goodall or, or uh, I forget what the other woman's name was. That, that uh, Diane Fossey. Yeah, Diane Fossey, and that, and that's because they <laughs> of their descriptions. They they did anthropomorphize their descriptions of them in the wild to engender them to people, and even mm-hmm. Jane Goodall said that you know she did that purposely. Because if you don't, you know, it, when, it, when it deals with conservation and care, that's the only way we want to care about something if it looks somewhat similar to sure. it. If it, looks, if it looks like a crab <laughs> or something, you know, and it's as big as we are, we're definitely not going to want to, you know, have anything to do with that. We could go, okay, wipe them all right. out if they're all gone, <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, it's a different situation. So, you know, I'm, I just, you know, these, these groups, uh, you know, I was looking at, at the culture and how different social group patterns are developed. And in, and in primates, whether it's, you know, you could apply this to humans, there's really six different types or groups. And there's single uh, female and her offspring, so mother, daughter, mother, son, uh, the monogamous family group, uh, polyandrous family group, uh, one male, several female group. And I'm reading this because I had to write a few of these things down today. Uh, multi-male and multi-female groups, and then the fission fusion society. And the fission fusion is more mm-hmm. common where they, you know, they get together, but they don't necessarily stay together. They, you know, a uh, female will leave the group, go to another one looking for males, or a male may leave the group, you know, going to bond with other males to go hunt and eat, whatever. Sure. How do you see these social groups for these creatures? Because the majority that I hear are, are uh and I, I don't jump around here a little bit, but this was a problem that I that I saw with uh, some 
I guess, intelligence, you'd call it, that was presented. It was some information presented by another organization. It was on a study they were doing, and I was watching television. And, and, and yeah, here's sort of the behaviors. Part of this has to do with the food supply because the areas they inhabit, you know, food, and, and this, this goes into their size and everything. They have to be the size they are to cover the ground they need to to get the amount of food they need. So that's the reason groups are kind of the size they are, typically four to six individuals. The groups, now let's say within a range, the ranges overlap. There can be, and I'll, I'll use the South Mount St. Helens area because there are three groups primarily in that 3,000 square mile area. Two of the groups are four member groups. One of the groups is a three member group. Sometimes that group uh, will split up and it's probably three rogue males, you know, that don't really have, you know, mates or anything. So they'll occasionally, some of them will join with the, one of the other groups and then they'll leave the groups. The groups are hierarchical. In other words, one of those groups is more dominant than the next and so on. And occasionally they'll bond together for reasons unknown, but only for a, a relatively short time period. Then they go their ways again. They, they separate. If they were, let's say, a larger group, you know, like, like we do, they'd run out of food pretty quickly, and it would kind of thwart their hunting abilities because being in small numbers really favors these things because the fewer numbers, they cover more of that ground in a feeding area, and they actually get more nutrition from that than trying to, I mean, you know, they would deplete an area too quickly, and they'd be on the move too often, so. Well, that, um, that behavior that you're that's kind of That's kind of how that works. That behavior that you're describing directly overlaps with everything i've read about primate yeah exactly you know so they, right. it's, it's the same type of thing it depends on you know, whether rhesus monkeys or whether they're orangutans or, or whether they're chimps uh orangutans tend to be more aggressive and and uh when you talk about vindictive or whatever they i don't know there's there's a there's a group of of uh, orangutans in africa that they uh and i'd, I'd have to look up the name of the place but uh where they would go in and raid crops and the local farmers you know the 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 people that have to interact with these things daily it's a negative interaction predominantly right and and they see them that way because they'll come in and it's premeditated and that's that's they say that Mm -hmm. you know chimps tend to be more opportunistic but they call them there they refer to them there as more human because they only take what they need to eat, you know, they they mm-hmm. leave, you know, but orangutans tend to come in and, and uh, they're more terrestrial, not, not necessarily, you know, tree-based. Uh, they're more ground-based right. creatures, but they come in and they have no fear of people and they raid and then they destroy the rest of the stuff that they're not going to eat which is, you know... These creatures, too, it could be the various types are going to have some different behavioral characteristics, I think. And as of this point, I don't really know, you know, what separates them, you know, which one is worse than the others, other than, you know, if you go by reports, if there's enough information that, you know, can help you identify which type a particular individual or individuals are from. But interaction with the locals and, you know, how that went and, you know, that sort of thing, too, because, you know, in Asia, you know, the... In, their culture, uh, and even in India, you know, they see these animals more godlike. You know, they, they do tend to treat them differently and things, but, you know, in Africa, not necessarily. Example from India, I've talked to a couple of different guys. One of them is actually, well, actually, they're both JRG members now. One of them it has um, a working relationship with, you know, what they call Bollywood. He's uh, a New Zealander that lives in northern India and, and works with that uh, that business. So he has, you know, he knows a lot of the locals. He's been there a long time. And we were talking not long ago about the tiger population. He was telling me about the tiger population making a big comeback, uh, more so than people think, and uh, about the, uh, the Indian military and their special forces. And apparently their special forces are pretty good. He says they're, they're on par with ours, probably trained by ours. Um, but there are places, you know, they go, they go in and take care of the poachers. They take care of the poachers that kill tigers and everything. So, and they're pretty, pretty relentless, I guess, and brutal. So the locals, when it comes to the Yeti, uh, that's a whole different thing. Of course, the locals, you know, human life isn't valued very high in India because there's so many people there. A lot of people, of course, get taken by tigers and other, other means of, you know, death. But 
so it's not looked into very hard, you know, when somebody comes up missing and somebody says, hey, you know, and a tiger got him or whoever. But uh, apparently when the Yeti, Yetis take people a lot, and he, they said that the locals are more fearful of the Yeti by far than they are the tiger, and the Indian Special Forces won't go anywhere near the places where the Yetis are. But it... I, I don't know about the vindictive part of that, you know, when it comes to, I mean, that's a that's a feeding behavior, but there's more of an example. Now, we know the Sasquatch has kind of a short temper. I mean, we can see that in lots and lots of reports, lots of stories. And I'm thinking of, of one, and I wish, I, I interviewed the guy for the show a few years back. He was in North Carolina at the time, I believe it was, and he talked about uh, some of the local communities where he was working. And apparently, for unknown reasons, one of these things was vindictively killing off livestock cows horses sheep pigs typically it would it would bite them through the back of the neck there's break their spine and then leave them uh very close to the person's home almost like you know it wanted them to know that it was killing their livestock and tw tell us about the uh the picture you had with the the dead sheep because I think oh, that's that a good goat? example. Yeah, that uh, yeah, that goat, was right. in uh, South Central Texas. Uh, a lady sent me a picture uh, wanting to know if this was a, uh, a mountain lion kill. And, and the more we went over it, I said, you know, mountain lions, they're not going to kill something right there within eye shot of your house. It was like, it was just a couple hundred yards from the woman's house. And it was drug f- towards What's the house, the house right? Uh, and the, the left front leg was totally dislodged and, and dismembered from the body. Uh, the goat was dead. I mean, it was it, it was graveyard dead, but and it was like within an eye shot of the of the house. So uh, yeah, that kind of reminded me of what the guy told me about in North Carolina because it wasn't particularly eating the animals. I mean, it did take some and eat them, but more often than not, it was simply killing livestock and leaving them where people would find yeah. them close by almost to say, Hey, I, I'm here. I'm doing this too bad. Pretty much. And there's, I mean, there's other stories out there, uh, about vindictive behavior, uh, uh, where, uh, guy that was in the military, this is during desert storm time frame, have went to desert storm and him and his, and his grandfather were unknowingly habituating a troop of Bigfoot. Well, is is he's off to war. His grandfather ends up having a heart attack, and going in the hospital. Well, by the time he got out of the hospital and got home, his uh, he had a herd of goats, and they were all killed. They were just laying out there in the field, dead, and all of them had their necks snapped. Yeah, they get vindictive. Nothing, nothing. Uh, just yeah, the just snapped. just. I mean, like thirty dead goats out in the field, and that was the thing is that they would they would feed these Bigfoot dog food in and sweet feed and then of course when grandpa got sick and had to go to the hospital nobody was there to leave him food and he was in the hospital a couple of weeks and when he got back all his goats were dead yeah they got angry because yeah food was gone with other predators sometimes too that and you know these are apex but you know where sometimes they'll kill as as more of a training thing you know where where they learn to how to perfect a kill and you know they might find uh, pets or other things that you know have been taken but not eaten by certain animals but uh, you know down at uh, in Foley uh, I kept in contact with those folks and you know uh, well we just got pictures you know the window that was broken shortly uh, after pretty and and so you know I, I got a hold of those folks and same thing and said you know have you matter of fact I just today and they said it's been fairly quiet I said, well, you know, maybe maybe we got lucky and they moved on. Uh, but if not, I would still, you know, be very cautious about what you're doing around there because the uh, TW, what happened was these folks had a lot of activity on their property. And, and I went down there to kind of check it out and, and uh, you know, look at some of the evidence they had things and, mm. and kind of had something happen that I couldn't really rationalize. You know, I, I heard, uh, you know, honestly, all the times I've heard it before, uh, recordings and everything, I thought it was kind of BS, this uh, samurai chatter, deep guttural, you know, like two people talking, but low enough where you can't hear it, and it sounds like, you know, gibberish almost. Yeah. Um, heard, heard that, and then two little ones uh, come running right at us, and, and one cut to the left, and the other one came straight at us, and uh, the guy I'm standing there with, you know, happened to 
speak out right about then, I think out of nervousness. And, uh, you know, they, it stopped immediately, and the other one backpedaled into the wood, and we couldn't see anything. The foliage was so thick. But um, right after that visit, um, somebody clear-cut that whole property on the other side of their, the woods on the other side of their pond, almost up to their pond. And, you know, that was not a very big greenway, but it, it followed this intermittent stream that led to the pond, and there's a, a, a natural spring right there at the end of their pond, too. So, you know, these, these things may have been coming there over and over again. It was a food source, a source of fresh water, you know, they whatever. And, and of course, uh, these folks had bush hogged the field between the pond. They found bedding spots out there. He... He turned around, looked through his window, and saw one standing across the fence that was, you know, 20 yards away. Uh, you know, one of the big ones and and stuff before, and you know, they were like, okay, now now what I know what this is, you know. So he wanted some standoff between his house and the pond. Well, you bush hog all the property down to the woods, and now a bunch of woods is missing. You know, they they uh, you know they might come back and not appreciate that very much, you know. <laughs> Where they think that it's actually useful. That was probably their avenue of approach. You know, and, and instead of, you know, they don't realize, you know, they don't care who took the woods. It's just people did. You know, they changed it. Well, isn't that, wasn't that the issue with Patty that they figured that that was why they ended up having so many sightings in that Bluff Creek area? Well, you know, that area had had, had a long history. When I interviewed Al Hodgson, and this was, you know, he said his family moved to Willow Creek back in the mid 1920s. Uh, that was something, and there, and this was long, many, many, many years before there were any kind of roads over into that country. You know, they they always talked about uh, people hearing the apes scream across the river, you know, across the uh, the Klamath River over there, and uh, they did start logging in there in the late 1950s. But you know, I don't know if that really caused any issues what it did cause it was after a decade of uh, intrusion by people in there the things finally bugged out of the area uh, and quit coming in there that's the issue that they've been having in in uh, you know far east deep deep east texas is is that that green belt area the the big piney certain swaths of land gets they cut down the timber and then it's just i mean it's barren for for miles and you know it's what it's one way to drive these things out of an area, and we know this. It's one of the things you know we advise people of, and I got this from inside contacts. Is if they start coming up, like the people in, uh, you know, Tammy and James, uh, if they've got stuff coming right up to their house, one of the questions I ask people: Do you have brush that grows right up to your house? Uh, it, usually they say yes, and we tell them to cut it back at least fifty feet. And that's one of the things that deters these things from coming up to a house. For some reason, they don't like to come out in the open and approach a house. Uh, for good reason, because, you know, they know people are dangerous. That's something that's probably an instinct with them. So, uh, you know, if they've got a concealed route to come in. Same with these large areas, these green belts. Uh, if they're cut back, and I'm sure whoever is in charge of handling all this stuff, they're probably well aware of that. If they get rid of that space... Uh, it alters the behaviors. Uh, there's other things like a lot of vehicular traffic that will move them out of an area. Also, you know, they sort of have to, uh, they sort of have to have free reign, you know, sort of things their way to come into an area to exhibit all these sorts of behaviors. But if if certain particulars are removed, it'll change the dynamics yeah. and they'll leave an area. Well, and that's uh, that has always been one of my. I, I, for lack of a better term, fallbacks is that if the the yeah. area is disturbed so dramatically, the uh, it's like any other animal; they're going to leave. Yeah, they might they might let you know that they don't like it before they leave. <laughs> exactly, absolutely, and in, like going back to the Bluff Creek thing, once that Sasquatch was filmed, there were all kinds of people crawling all over that place, you know, looky loos and investigators and so on. You know, from that time forward, you know, if that was an area that I was coming in to feed occasionally, and they were only coming in there about every two to three years, I, I think I'd move somewhere else a little more suitable away from, you know, those pesky humans exactly. that we don't exactly. like anyway. Well, and that's the thing, you know, it's 
uh, on the, the, the apex predator scale, we're really at the top of the scale. Uh, not because we're, we're massively stronger or massively built. It's because we, we tend to, to it's kind of like velociraptors. They hunted in packs. Well, so do we, and we, uh, we right. tend to be extremely violent and that's the one. And, and well, that's, that's right, the one thing right. I tell everybody, you know, when they, they, they throw a skeptical eye at it and that's fine. You know, skepticism's good. One fellow student that said, uh, you know, we got enough Bubba's in this country. They, they, you know, enough rednecks. They should have killed one by now. And I said, okay, look at it like this. Why would a creature that exhibits a certain amount of intelligence that is a, for, for lack of a better term, a savant in the wilderness setting, uh, they know how to stay concealed. They know how to hunt quietly. Why would they want to even be around us or anywhere near us to where we do get a shot at them? Because we're extremely violent. They don't know. And Jay, yeah, what that brings up a good point. And it sort of ties into something Jay said earlier about, you know, we have this innate fear of the dark and what might be out there. And personally, I think that goes back to early humans interaction with these things. You know, the Sasquatch is the boogeyman Boy, that we I, fear. I watched a, a movie the other day called Boggy Creek, the Beast mm -hmm. of Boggy Creek. It was just named Boggy Creek. Now, granted, it was it was a fictionalized movie, uh, and for all intents and purposes, the acting really sucked. But at the end of the movie, the the lone survivor in this group is sitting in this clearing, and she looks up, and there's a Sasquatch standing right there. And it roared, and, and out of the wood line come like 20 of them. Never even knew that they were there. You know, the, the, yeah. the premise that, and I, you know, I, I tell uh, investigators in my district, don't go in by yourself. You, you go in two or three strong. You know, you know one of the, the biggest problems I have with this is that we, human beings, we think we're almost aloof in, in our perceptions of ourselves. How we Absolutely. perceive our environment today, um, we have convinced ourselves, and I think through the media and everything else, that you know, because we've got internet, because we have technology and all this stuff, that we know everything there is to know about everything. I I, uh, I fly, you know, so I'll take someone up in a plane here locally, and immediately they say, <laughs> "Wow, I didn't realize there was that much woods around here," because what do we do? We drive down an interstate or a highway and it's cut back on either side and we go from our populated area to our populated area we go to work and we stop at walmart and we come home you know we're not today walking through the woods and living in the woods after dark like people did 200 years ago it's been a superb marketing job you know to convince everyone that this is our reality this is the reality that human beings have made for ourselves and the planet everybody that's sort of you know in urbanized areas for the most part and and even some outside of that really kind of buy well, into that and as each generation successive one comes along they're more and more entrenched into that thought and it's no and what, I was gonna, what i was gonna say too though is that they also immediately impart that this is just a dumb animal in the woods if you live in wilderness in colorado or you live in eastern texas or if you live somewhere in the, in the rockies where there's you know a, a real threat potential for you know mountain lion and black bear or grizzly you're probably not going to go out in the woods without a hand without a weapon without a sidearm and if you, if you did that's right someone's going to look at you like you are stupid you know the general population that's used to that is going to look at you like you're the crazy one but if you go to the East Coast, you know, some city guy, and you talk to them, they're not thinking about that stuff. Oh, I'm going to go spend a day in the woods, walk around some trails, you know, do whatever. It's uh, whatever. If if you talk to people who are in areas that are frequented by these things, it is a known. There is no doubt in their mind they, they've either had encounters themselves, they have family members that have been telling, telling stories, you know, their whole lives, a neighbor. You know, if you go to these areas, it's it's beyond folklore and and i think it's interesting that we can look at you know animals that we know orangutans for example like this group and 
I looked it up. It was it's actually in um, the Neuro Kingdom, Uganda. Uh, but these these um, orangutan groups uh, post sentries in trees uh, to watch for farmer patrols, and then they actually uh, um, set diversions so that purposely so so mm-hmm. they get the uh, guard attention so that others in the group can travel through there unnoticed. You know, they, I mean, there's an ecology. Right, and we know the Sasquatch uses and, sentries and think, also. You know, these creatures are exponentially more intelligent than, you know, orangutans and, you know, potentially great apes, you know? So, so when we already see measurable intelligence in these animals that we, that we you know, take as day-to-day animals now, even though they are still fairly rare, um, you know, and then we try and superimpose, you know, that this thing is dumb as my dog, you know, out in the woods, that, you know. And that's yet to get another parallel or comparative behavior, you know, for orangutans, and I'm sure chimps do it, uh, and other other apes also post sentries. We know the Sasquatch does too. They discover that from my own field work, but uh, so it, that's definitely counter. I, I think that may exactly be what that was. You know, it was right at a creek crossing yeah. and, and a gravel road. You know, it, it was you know eleven o'clock at night. You know, during their hunting cycle, uh, that that may have been a century. And you're not only the enemy; you're also marking hey, let's, its territory. Can we, can we talk for a, a, <laughs> a, just a second about uh, biology, too, because there, you know, reading into you know yeah. some of these things about primates, you know, the the different types of cats, um, rhesus monkeys, and different things. You know, gorillas are very different than uh, chimpanzees. Chimpanzees tend to be a lot more social, uh, spread out in an area, larger groups, you know, those things. Mm-hmm. Gorillas tend to be a lot more isolated uh, um, and things. So when when these groups are isolated, uh, like you, and this, this pretty much correlates to what you talked about before about, you know, the size of the animal, the food sources available, um, not necessarily creating pressures for other subgroups for their own survival. Uh, not mm-hmm. that they're thinking about doing that, but it's just part of, you know, what happens. Um, but they tend to be animals that then can, uh, when they get on the boundary of their areas, vocalize. So, you know, you've got, you know, we have the ability for speech. And they already know that the physiology in apes and chimps are, are limited, so they can't form complex speech or words. But they can learn. Right constructs of words and meanings and putting things together and even deceitfulness, you know, which is interesting. But what I heard, you know, and I've heard this over and over again, uh, I mean, created so much power. I mean, it was, it was, it was a very percussive shake your insides kind of thing, you know, uh, that, you know, that's an animal that needs to broadcast over a vast distance. And they do, and they cover such huge chunks of land, uh, and, and all that's in their benefit. So, you know, we hear the howls and the yells, you know, these things, you know, and, and you know, we say, oh, well, you know, that's because there it may be a solitary creature out there, whatever, but, you know, that speaks more to, you know, maybe these small subgroups that may potentially avoid each other, Uh until a time when right they just absolutely um, and like I, I mentioned earlier the different groups there will be a hierarchy between the groups in other words one one group will be more dominant than, than another one and that all goes into survival I mean it, it sort of keeps them from you know fighting and, and potentially dying when they don't need to if they simply maintain their space by letting another group know that they're in the area there was a report I got uh, a while back where there was, you know, a lot of this vocalizing, and it sounded by the witnesses, you know, as if there were two groups of chimps, you know, making all this racket back and forth, and then suddenly, uh, apparently, one of the uh, the alphas got involved and roared, and then <laughs> went silent, and the two groups simply went went their own ways. Uh, and, and that's something you see in other primate groups also, you know, where... 
you know, initial encounters will be, there'll be a lot of ruckus, a lot of noise, a lot of posturing. It's what, it's what they do. It's the whole reason for the lip flip. Uh, it's a challenge, you know, to show you that, hey, I've, I've got bigger teeth than you. You know, you don't want to fight me. Stay away. So all that noise and ruckus. And then when the dominant male of what the dominant group apparently steps up and, and makes this display, then that's it. It's, it's the, the contest is decided and they simply, you know, pass without any sort of altercation. Uh, you know, it satisfies the dominance issue and it also keeps everybody safe. Yeah, they, they, you know, primates tend to be not accepting of outsiders. <laughs> you, you know, they... Exactly, and we're a good example right. of that. <laughs> yeah, and we, we think we're, we're culturally advanced, civil, right? Right. We, we lost T.W., I think maybe uh, he has, hasn't messaged me, so maybe he had to leave, but uh, we'll, we'll carry on. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you can look at human history. We're, you know, a really prime example of that. And even with other groups of chimps, so I mean, you can look on YouTube. There are videos up there of, uh, you know, chimps warring between themselves, uh, you know, where for whatever reason, whether it's territory, food, mates, whatever, but sometimes, and a lot of times chimps will even attack uh, an individual from another band, and they'll kill them and eat yeah. them. Yeah, uh, form war parties, and, you know, males will go along with it to establish yeah. relationships you know, amongst their own. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I watched a film when I was in college many years ago. Um, they were talking about, and they, they showed us a film on, with these chimps, and the researchers were out there, they'd established, you know, their presence with this particular band of chimps. I think were, there were 15 or 20 animals in the group. Then they, then they identified, you know, each of the males and their place in the hierarchy, but they were always testing, you know, to see you know, jockeying for position. Kind of sounded like mm. the military. <laughs> you know, everybody is always jockeying for position, you know, to move up one step. Then the researchers did a test. You know, it's always whoever you know, is bigger can look bigger. That's why when you see them open their arms up and, and do things like that, they make themselves look bigger and the screaming, you know, and they thrash brush and things like that. Uh, one of the researchers took this metal five-gallon can and put it, in the place where they uh, they would gather every day, and one of the lesser males that was kind of way down the list uh, grabbed this can and started rolling it, making a whole bunch of noise. Well, it scared the hell out of the other males. So all of a sudden, this lesser male, and he was, I mean, way down the hierarchy list, became the dominant male of the group. Uh, it was interesting how just weird, you know, things like that, but part of that you know when it comes to that those displays and that kind of behavior and again that's one of those comparative anthropology things you know when you look at um uh you know chimps for example you know grabbing brush and, and thrashing it back and forth uh there's been plenty of accounts where witnesses talk about the sasquatch doing that and i'll give you an example i interviewed a guy back in 1992 he told me he, that he was a, a former hell's angels member and uh him and a, a buddy of his in the motorcycle group were going to Southern Oregon to look for the Port Orphan Meteor. So they rode to Southern Oregon uh, out towards the coast to look for where this meteor had been reported going down, you know, decades before, uh, thinking they were going to make a lot of money from it. So they made their camp that evening while they were sitting around the fire. They heard this noise up on the ridge above them and they thought it was a person up there. So the noise kept getting, and I can't remember if it was, I think it was a vocal, vocalization. Periodically, as this individual was coming down the ridge in the dark, it would scream or make this noise. And then suddenly, it pops out of the tree line, maybe 30 feet from where their fire was. And there were sapling trees there, and it grabbed a couple of them and was just thrashing it back and forth and making this huge ruckus. And you know from his description of course they both instinctively they thought they were on the menu they grabbed their 30 30s and each put a round in his chest and it screeched and took off but you know that display was exactly like what you see mm -hmm. chimps doing you know it was probably coming down there challenging them you know making itself like it needed to make itself look bigger but there were two men and one of it so and again that goes back to you know probably the prehistoric relationship between humans and these things, which I, I don't believe was very good. Um, so if it's a numbers, if it's a numbers game, 
you know, one Sasquatch, two or more people, it would need to make itself well, look bigger I, you know, and better. I, I felt like that's what I was witnessing. Well, one, I'm peeing on the ground marking its territory, but, you know, it was, it was a... Exactly. It, it was a, a vocal display of power. I mean, to say, look how loud I can scream. And let it, letting you know I've hit limbs, yeah. breaking branches. I mean, it was it was like... Yeah, like a big ruckus, you know, throws just pounding away. Yeah, and, it yeah. wasn't trying to move away quietly like they typically do. It, it, it was, was making it was itself well known. Let me know how big and powerful this thing was, and, and I got the heck out of it. So, okay, so that's exactly that know, same kind of display. You, know, you see that, and it's like there are just so many comparisons, you know, to this. So I, that's what I say. I think I think if we use, which is what our goal is, is to use comparative anthropology we can pretty i think pretty much figure out a lot more than has has been done previously about these things a lot of people they uh, like you were bringing up some good points earlier these groups you know it's more about what they think and feel than comparing to what we do yeah, know to something we don't know you know there are there are footprint casts there are you know there's thousands and thousands of witness reports uh and and there's evidence, a lot of trace but, evidence uh, the physical descriptions that I'm getting from folks around here and stuff too, um, all kind of describe two different creatures. But one is more man size, and the other one is, you know, the big muscular, eight nine foot tall, you know, sort of thing. Those tend to look more human in the face. The other ones look more monkey in the face. Yeah. But when you when you draw comparisons, just straight up between great apes and and humans. Um, the big difference is, you know, the likenesses are we both have 32 teeth. We both have multiple tongue, those things. But what we, we diverge mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, all these primates have uh, prehensile feet, too. Well, you know, the, these creatures don't. Right. You know, they some have more of a divergent big toe, you know, in some of the cats and things, but but more common with primates than us is the flat footedness, wide foot to carry the weight. Um, you know, what I've heard about, you know, studied bipedal locomotion when they talked about doing the comparisons with uh, the patty film and the way people have seen these things move, uh, where we we can lock our knee, mm -hmm. and they apparently can't. You know, thing, things like that, that that are right in between right now that, that predominantly lock our knees. Right. Uh, you know, we've got got a wider. You know, and the interesting thing with that is, we're actually right, and we're relatively newcomers to the primate scene. There so, we go. Sorry so, about and that. We've got you know pretty much twice the brain capacity uh, than than most apes do. Uh, so that that's a difference, you know. But then if you if you drop, you know, this creature right in between those two. It lines right up with the physiology differences between them. Um, yeah, I think that's what would be extremely interesting is, is you know, looking at their, what kind of vocal cords they must have, lung capacity, you know, the size of their brain. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that one hasn't been taken. I don't know, you know, but whoever, if they do have one and someone's studying it, you know, what a job that is. <laughs> Well, I, all I can tell you is my, my source that I call Mr. Black, and, and he's been pretty spot on with all his information, told me once that he knows one particular scientist, he knows had dissected at least two of them. Uh, and when he described, he said what, they, what he told him was, uh, in terms of vocal cords, they had what looked like two sets of vocal cords the purpose of you know which they didn't know um so i mean there were some interesting details that you couldn't just make up i mean it was it was stuff that and he actually gave me enough information to verify who he is and his background so if you look at what great apes do to have you know chimps and mechanics mm -hmm. and things that have the power to vocalize way beyond human range you know in, in, in volume and range, right. uh, and then look at what humans have. If these fall in between those, it would make mm -hmm. sense that they would, 
either have some combined capability or, or you know, some more policy. Or yeah, some that, sort of a that, different that structure, maybe. lends itself to, you know, living in both environments, you know, so. If I had my guess, I would say these guys are probably in the hominid family, which would differentiate them from apes. That's why there would be so much of a different structure. You know, it wasn't that many eons ago that we weren't like we are currently, that we were more, you know, you know, hair-covered and ape-like. Um, and they still don't know, you know, why we developed the way we did. Yeah, that, that, Danny I think that uh, anyone that, that can get their hands on that and read it, you know, it reads like a doctoral thesis for sure, but it, uh, I think that does a, a very, proposes a very compelling argument as to, yeah, as it's to, pretty interesting, you isn't know, it? the science behind it and, and, you know, what, what environmental pressures lead, you know, that sort of change. So. Mm-hmm. And it would certainly explain our behavior since that time. I mean, you know, the violent nature that we have. I mean, the, the one constant in human history is warfare. It's the one thing that is, has been always present. You know, forms of government, things like that come and go. But when it comes to our vicious aggressiveness towards everything and each other, um, it makes you wonder about the cause of that. I mean, it's almost like there was an external force that did so ingrain that in us it almost made it a necessity well, for and that's survival. what he poses is that you know when if if early hominids were driven to near extinction by uh you know neanderthal raids um and and that we were predated by those beings um that, that there would be a necessity um to be able to identify the differences you know it's, uh, and, and my guess again would be that it wasn't Neanderthal, it was actually these creatures that caused that. And it, even to this very day, explains the interaction between humans and these things. Why they stay that, away from us so much. Really. I think that at one point in our history that we thought we... Yeah, I think at one point in our history we believed that we exterminated And, and they have found both bones mixed. And they know that Neanderthals buried their own, cared about their own. But didn't care about us exactly. because they found early hominid bones in the the pile of their uh, their kills, you know, with deer bones and whatever else they had there. Right. Yeah, discarded like just like discarded. Uh, so mm-hmm. so they know that you know there was something going on there that for at least ten thousand years there was some interaction and uh, you know the guy that wrote that paper you know. I mean, goes tells you exactly where they found these things and has it all documented. And, and it's interesting how what he had the artist do with the reconstruction oh, yeah. mm-hmm. on the, the skull. It's always interested me, you know, they, for years they always made Neanderthals out to look like a really ugly human. When in fact, you know, the, the method they use on that, so that when we find a human, a homo sapien uh, skeleton, we can do a pretty good reconstruction because something with a different species, they don't know all that, so they were making assumptions that might have been completely off. Whereas his artist, now I, I think the eyes are wrong, you know, I, I understand why he made the assumptions that he did, but you know, when you look at the reconstruction, it's that would have been a pretty frightening thing. And, and I'll tell you, I've had a lot of eyewitnesses tell me that was the closest, you know, we had the eyes and the nose changed uh, on that artwork. And many people have told me that is the closest rendition to what they saw that they've ever seen. The only difference is being minor with some hair placement. But other than that, they say that's what, what they saw. What frustrates me is, you know, you run into like three different types of people. You run into the person that says, you know, hey, that's interesting, maybe. And then you run mm-hmm. into, well, maybe four types. But then you, then you run into the person who is like, ah, oh, that's a bunch of crap, immediately. You know, now nope, doesn't negative not going to right and and isn't even willing to pose questions or or say okay well let's entertain this idea you know and and yeah they just immediately just closed and I, minded. I think that's striking something in them to where they don't want to so it would change their reality it would you know it, I think it also goes back to that primal fear that might that these things might be the source of. I mean, there, there's a lot of things in our psyche conflict. You know, a lot of people who are probably closer to primal than others. 
do that. Yeah, well, this is uh, true. <laughs> and, and then the other ones that frustrate me are the people, and I fall in category sometimes, is who enter, you know, well, okay, you've got, you know, the people who know. I mean, you've, if you've had this thing stand in front of you, you know, if you, whatever. But let's just say you haven't, mm-hmm. and, and they're willing to entertain the idea. Then you've got that group that... Right. Suddenly, you know, every sound is a Sasquatch, or you know, every every uh, uh, bit of uh, data is valid. You know, and, and just as dangerous. So, right. You know, <laughs> I got frustrated because you know, my, in the military, you know, I, I, we did some intelligence work and stuff. So there's different tools you use to develop patterns and whatnot, and and it's pretty easy to apply these things, but. I was watching one of these shows, and, and there was a uh, doctor on there, and, and he said, you know, look what I did. I, I took all of his patterns of activity, and I plotted all these dots, all the map, and, you know, it's in these mountainous ranges, and, you know, during this time of the year, they come down to here, and this time of the year, they're here, and all this, and this is all based off of reporting. And he said, you know, this is Sasquatch behavior, Bigfoot behavior, you know, take it to the bank. And, and I thought, no. That's human behavior. You know, who, where are you getting your information from? You know, your source yeah, exactly. data is coming from humans who are in that environment at that time. What were they doing there? All you're doing is bi- building a pattern of human behavior at that time at those elevations. Now, you can, you know, say that those do cross, you know, that if they had an encounter, well, then that, that creature was there at that time or whatever. And there's a correlation but you can't just chalk it up to say, you know, this is what they were doing at that time. And there's the people that a lot of them like, you know, on our Facebook page the other day, there was a guy, um, he posted a picture of so, of a forest setting, and and uh, he claimed that there was a shadow that was a Bigfoot. And there, were, there was lots of discussion on it, and uh, I didn't see anything in the picture. I mean, it wasn't really worth my time looking at it. it was too it was one of those it was kind of a distant shot of some trees and and the guy was making all sorts of claims and he circled a, a shadow and said now do you see it and a friend of mine that's uh he used to be part of my field teams back in the 90s uh who is uh sioux indian and a pretty good tracker uh he's pretty dry sense of humor but when you when you know what he's dan sense of humor is like he's pretty funny and he, at one point he was part of the conversation he says Oh, yeah, up in the corner, there was some fog or something in part of the picture. He says, I, I see the Bigfoot up there sending smoke signals. <laughs> and the guy, the guy all of a sudden, he says, oh, yeah, I saw that, too. Yeah. You know, he was serious about it. And, and then my buddy Dan calls me immediately afterwards, was laughing about it. He says, geez, I was just pulling the guy's leg. And, you know, but, so, but like you said, you know, there's so many people that well, they it, want to it's believe called this paranoia. And, and, it, and it's, it's something that, you know, you can be... Yeah. Sitting in your bathroom, looking at the floor tiles and seeing faces in the tile, you know, or looking at wood knots in a wooden door. Yeah, and there's and, a little, uh, little bit of insanity in that. You know, when I was taking my psych courses at WSU, they talked about that yeah. sort of thing. It's like the Rorschach test. Everybody always says, well, what are you supposed to see in a Rorschach test? And the correct answer is you're not supposed to see well, anything. And it, <laughs> whether someone is more in tune to trying to please the the person that's any the question or sure. or you know is, are they answering you know where do they stand in them you know it's, right. but yeah i mean it's it's very easy <laughs> to you know there's pictures of like there was a blackbird i think that was flying in front of a camera and somebody got a picture of it and it looked like this big black blob back in the bushes but actually a bird flying in front of the camera mm-hmm. and the motion blur and everything made it just look like it was back in the in the bushes or whatever so you know it, a lot of things can be explained, um, and, and I think we need to keep you know a high level of skepticism with what we're doing. Because when you were in you were in Alabama recently, yeah, you and I have the same outlook. Or when you were in Alabama recently, you know, and you you guys heard the the mumbling, and then the two little ones, you got you actually wanted to go right directly to the spot and see what was there. I'm the same way. If if I see or hear something, I'm going to go charging in there to see what's there. I don't want to you know, take a picture of some brush and say, oh, well, I, you know, I want to backs it up. And when I was trying to use the camera just before it got dark, it wouldn't work. And I, I swear to God, people keep saying it. And, and <laughs> you know, I, I've heard recordings of the mumbling and all that stuff, and I thought it's a bunch of hogwash. I, I don't know that I'd buy that. 
And the mm-hmm. only reason is because I didn't personally experience that. So am I a hypocrite? Yeah, probably. Right, right. Um, but you still have to kind of keep that in your head um, until something validates that, you know, this is going on right now. And, of course, you don't want to put eyes on, so I'm going to go trudging right out there and look. But, it, you know, it's dumb because it would be the last thing I ever do. <laughs> right. But, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, listen, Jay, we're running out of time. Thanks for joining us this week. We're going to continue the discussion next week. TW got kicked off the line and wasn't able to come back on, so uh, he's having some computer issues. So with the same folks, maybe uh, an additional one. Maybe I can get one of our scientists on, too. Maybe we can get Mark Dobbs on. He's our forensic anthropologist. But check out the website, williamjebbing.com. If you haven't subscribed yet, go to Podbean and uh, sign up for Witness of the Un- Unknown. It's my one-on-one interviews with Sasquatch eyewitnesses. Thanks for joining us this week, folks. Just, you know, in China, with, I mean, you can look in other parts of the world, South America. Uh, I mean, had grizzlies and, and black bears in Yellowstone got conditioned to people giving them food. And when they weren't getting it, they started pulling doors off cars and, and getting very aggressive and violent. Uh, and, we, and we hear stories of this all the time with the Sasquatch, whether food is being left out and then all of a sudden it isn't available or they're leaving food out for these things and it stops. Then they get very aggressive. Yeah, or they've heard about where there's a garden that they frequent. And here's one thing that I learned about primates that I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking about. And it's, the, it's one, when you get a differentiation between human behavior and, and primate behavior, great age. Uh, you know, hum, humans have homesteads. And even if we're considered nomadic, we still carry our home with us, a tent, camper, right. you know, something like that. We do that. Great apes don't. They, they don't have a home. They're, they're always moving around. They're always building small nests Absolutely. and things. So, so they, <clears throat> they remember where the food sources are. They remember to, you know, what types of food sources, when things are in bloom, fruit, you know, different things like that, and, and when to go to these areas. So, you know, my question for you, would, uh, Will, would be, you know, how do you see these groups uh, bonding together? Because that's one of the cultural questions I have because, you know, even even chimps have culture, and you know people might laugh at that or whatever. But um, you know, we know chimps are smart. We know great apes are smart. We know there have been uh, you know apes or primates in captivity that have learned up to a hundred uh, sign language, you know, words and sign language and gestures. Uh, they're aware enough to even uh, be able to combine symbols that they were taught when they see something new, like there was a, a female chimp that saw a swan and the first time said water bird, sign for water mm-hmm. bird. You know, so there, there's more intellect there than I think we probably want to allude to, even in the wild. Well, uh, Jane Goodall makes that analogy. Oh, definitely. She, I mean, a lot of mainstream science does not like Jane Goodall or, or uh, I forget what the other woman's name was. That, that uh, Diane Fossey. Yeah, Diane Fossey. And, that, and that's because they of their descriptions. They, they did anthropomorphize their descriptions of them in the wild to engender them to people. And even mm-hmm. Jane Goodall said that, you know, she did that purposely 
because if you don't, you know, it, when, it, when it deals with conservation and care, that's the only way we want to care about something if it looks somewhat similar to sure. it. If it, looks, if it looks like a crab <laughs> or something, you know, and it's as big as we are, we're definitely not going to want to, you know, have anything to do with that. We could go, okay, wipe them all right. out if they're all gone. <laughs> You know, but, but, you know, it's a different situation. So, you know, I'm, I just, you know, these these groups, uh, you know, I was looking at, at the culture and how different social group patterns are developed. And in, and in primates, whether it's, you know, you could apply this to humans, there's really six different types or groups. And there's single uh, female and her offspring, so mother, daughter, mother, son, uh, the monogamous family group. Uh, polyandrous family group, uh, one male, several female group, and I'm reading this because I had to write a few of these things down. Okay. Uh, multi male and multi female groups, and then the fission fusion society. And the fission fusion is more mm-hmm. common where they, you know, they get together, but they don't necessarily stay together. They, you know, a uh, female will leave the group, go to another one working for males, or a male may leave the group, you know, going to bond with other males to go hunt and eat, whatever. Sure. How do you see these social groups for these creatures? Because the majority that I hear are, are uh, and I and I'm jump around here a little bit, but this is a problem that I that I saw with uh, some, I guess, intelligence you'd call it that was presented. It was some information presented by another organization. It was on a study they were doing, and I was watching television. And, uh, and yeah, here's sort of the behaviors. Part of this has to do with the food supply because the areas they inhabit. You know, food, and, and this this goes into their size and everything. They have to be the size they are to cover the ground they need to, to get the amount of food they need. So that's the reason the groups are kind of the size they are, typically four to six individuals. The groups, now let's say within a range, the ranges overlap. There can be, and I'll, I'll use the South Mount St. Helens area because there are three groups primarily in that 3,000 square mile area. Two of the groups are four member groups. One of the groups is a three member group. Sometimes that group uh, will split up, and it's probably three rogue males, you know, that don't really have, you know, mates or anything. So they'll occasionally, some of them will join with the, one of the other groups, and then they'll leave the groups. The groups are hierarchical. In other words, one of those groups is more dominant than the next, and so on. And occasionally they'll bond together for reasons unknown but only for a, a relatively short time period, then they go their ways again, they, they separate. If they were, let's say, a larger group, you know, like, like we do, they'd run out of food pretty quickly, and it would kind of thwart their hunting abilities because being in small numbers really favors these things because the fewer numbers, they cover more of that ground in a feeding area, and they actually get more nutrition from that than trying to... I mean, you know, they would deplete an area too quickly and they'd be on the move too often, so... Well, that, um, that behavior... That that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of how that works. everyone. Welcome to another edition of Bigfoot Notes from the Field. I'm your host, William Jebning. I have uh, Jay and TW on this evening. They are both regional directors for the JRG, Jay for the Southeast, TW is for the Southwest. Going to discuss, as we brought up at the end of last week's show, some of the vindictive kinds of behaviors that Sasquatches seem to exhibit. I was going to do a little research and try to dig up some of that, but 
you know, when you start getting into some of those accounts, and I have tons of them, uh, it gets to be a little daunting. I mean, it's it's one of those things, you know, you do is for book research because you make notes and you spend a lot of time doing it. But I only had a couple hours to work with in the past few days, so I didn't do it. So we'll start off with that, and, uh, you know, wherever the conversation leads is where it leads. That's sort of the way this show works. So, fellows, welcome this evening. Hi. Uh, yeah, good evening. Now, I know, Jay, you've actually studied some of the uh, the primate behaviors and done some comparative anthropology. And, and TW, you have too, basically, since you're in college currently taking some coursework. I guess let's kind of talk about some of those things. I mean, we mentioned last week about using comparative anthropology, and I think that's very important. It's something you kind of have to do if you don't know much about an unknown species or an unrecognized species, but you know kind of the basic family they belong to. Sasquatch is obviously a primate. You know, everything that constitutes what a primate is, the Sasquatch has. So uh, it's not that's not even a question. They're, they're definitely in a primate family. So we can reasonably assume that they're going to have similar to behaviors to other primate species. Well, you... first of all, I'd like to start by saying that I'm, I'm not an anthropologist or a biologist, so <laughs> that I that I read a lot. So uh, yeah, I've uh, I think the closest that that we could get, you know, without actually having, you know, something to study, you know, in front of us, which we all kind of wish we did, uh, at at our own uh, under our own conditions, is to to look at ourselves and then look at primates you know the closest that we can find and figure out what those behavior traits are um, I mean if you're if you're a purist in science they say you know use of anthropometric uh, language or anthropomorphic I mean uh, language or or uh, an approach is taboo you know that you should be looking at at strictly studying behaviors uh, and not trying to superimpose you know, human emotion or intent or thoughts or anything like that on whatever you're going to study. Um, on the flip side of that coin, it's also been written that if we don't impart some sort of empathy to the subject that you're studying, then, then you lose the ability to learn about it and yourself. I, I think there's a fair amount of information out there already that suggests, um, I mean, we could coldly uh, look at monkeys and apes and and orangutans and things like that and say, you know, while they look a lot like us, so those similarities, you know, demand that they have um, thoughts and ideas and cares or emotions like we do. Um, but we but we already have observed some of those things with, with great apes and with, you know, uh, chimps in particular, where we know, and, and I think this goes back to um, some maybe primal instinct, but uh, they've studied chimps in the wild and in, in captivity and shown that, you know, when they're begging for food, they, they do that with an open palm. There's been times when they would bare their teeth and hold their hand out, which, you know, we see that behavior in human beings. You know, we ask for things, we reach out, we put our open hand out, hey, give me this, you know, those types of things. Uh, they've seen uh, female chimps um, shaking their head left, right, side to side and, and imposing uh, a negative emotion or, or it's when, you know, they're trying to tell a little one, don't climb that tree, you know, or they're doing something that, that we perceive they don't want them to do, uh, you know, maybe approaching a male that's agitated or something, and they've seen them shaking their head. So, you know, is that where we get that from? You know, it's not a learned behavior from them watching us when they study them and they see them doing this in the wild. So, you know, there's some things that I think you could draw some actual comparisons to. Yeah, I think, I think the difference thing, between. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, that's all right. I was just going to say one. You know, the fundamental question everybody says is, you know, where they come from. Are oh, his uh, he had a herd of goats, and they were all killed. They were just laying out there in the field, dead, and all of them had their necks snapped. Yeah, they get vindictive. Nothing. Nothing. Uh... Just yeah, just, snap. just, I mean, like 30 dead goats out in the field. And that was the thing is that they would, they would feed these Bigfoot dog food in, in sweet feed. And then, of course, when Grandpa got sick and had to go to the hospital, nobody was there to leave him food. And he was in the hospital a couple of weeks. And when he got back, all his goats were dead. Yeah, they got angry because yeah. the food was gone. With other predators sometimes, too, that in, you know, these are apex, but you know, where sometimes they'll kill as, as more of a training thing, 
you know, where, where they learned uh, how to perfect a kill and, you know, they might find uh, pets or other things that, you know, have been taken but not eaten by certain animals. But, uh, you know, down at, uh, in Foley, uh, I kept in contact with those folks and, you know, uh, well, we just got pictures, you know, the window that was broken shortly uh, and, and so, you know, I, I got a hold of those folks and same thing and said, you know, have you, matter of fact, I just today, and they said it's been fairly quiet. I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe we got lucky and they moved on. Uh, but if not, I would still, you know, be very cautious about what you're doing around there because the uh, TW, what happened was these folks had a lot of activity on their property. And, and I went down there to kind of check it out and, and uh, you know, look at some of the evidence they had things, and mm. and kind of had something happen that I couldn't really rationalize. You know, I, I heard, uh, you know, honestly, all the times I've heard it before, uh, recordings and everything, I thought it was kind of BS. This uh, samurai chatter, deep guttural, you know, like two people talking, but low enough where you can't hear it, and it sounds like you know gibberish almost. Yeah. Um, heard heard that, and then two little ones. Uh, come running right at us and and one cut to the left the other one came straight at us and uh, the guy I'm standing there with you know happened to speak out right about then I think out of nervousness and uh, you know they it stopped immediately and the other one backpedaled into the wood and we couldn't see anything the foliage was so thick but um, right after that visit um, somebody clear cut that whole property on the other side of their the woods on the other side of their pond almost up to their pond and you know that was not a very big greenway but it, it followed this intermittent stream that led to the pond and there's a, a, a natural spring right there at the end of their pond too so you know these, these things may have been coming there over and over again it was a food source a source of fresh water you know they whatever and and of course uh, these folks had bush hog the field between the pots they found bedding spots out there he he turned around looked through his window and saw one standing across the fence that was you know 20 yards away uh you know one of the big ones and and stuff before and you know they were like okay now now what i know what this is you know so he wanted some standoff between his house and the pot well you bush hog all the property down to the woods and now a bunch of woods is missing you know they they uh, you know they might come back and not appreciate that very much. You know <laughs> where they think that it's actually these. Folks. That was probably their avenue of approach. You know, and and instead of you know they don't realize you know they don't care who took the woods. It's just people did. You know they changed it. Well, in that it, wasn't that the issue with Patty that they figured that that was why they ended up having so many sightings in that bluff creek area well you know that area had, had had a long history when i interviewed al hodgson and this was you know he said his family moved to willow creek back in the mid-1920s uh that was something and there and this was long many 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 years before there were any kind of roads over into that country you know they they always talked about uh people hearing the apes scream across the river you know across the uh the klamath river over there and uh they did start logging in there in the late 1950s, but, you know, I don't know if that really caused any issues. What it did cause it was after a decade of uh, intrusion by people in there, the things finally bugged out of the area uh, and quit coming in there. That's the issue that they've been having in, in uh, you know, far east, deep, deep east Texas is, is that that green belt area the the big piney certain swaths of land gets they cut down the timber and then it's just i mean it's barren for for miles and you know it's what it's one way to drive these things out of an area and we know this it's one of the things you know we advise people of and i got this from inside contacts is if they start coming up like the people in uh you know tammy and james uh if they've got stuff coming right up to their house one of the questions i ask people do you have brush that grows right up to your house uh it, usually they say yes and we tell them to cut it back at least 50 feet and that's one of the things that deters these things from coming up to a house for some reason they don't like to come out in the open and approach a house uh, for good reason because you know they know people are dangerous that's something that's probably an instinct with them so 
um, you know, if they've got a concealed route to come in. Same with these large areas, these green belts. Uh, if they're cut back, and I'm sure whoever is in charge of handling all this stuff. That behavior that you're describing directly overlaps with everything I've read about primate. Yeah, exactly. You know, so they, right. it's, it's the same type of thing. It depends on you know, whether they're rhesus monkeys or whether they're orangutans or, or whether they're chimps. Uh, orangutans tend to be more aggressive, and, and uh, when you talk about vindictive or whatever, they... I don't know. There's there's a there's a group of, of uh, orangutans in Africa that they uh, and I'd, I'd have to look up the name of the place, but uh, where they would go in and raid crops and the local farmers. You know the, the the people that have to interact with these things daily. It's a negative interaction, predominantly. Right. And and they see them that way because they'll come in and it's premeditated and that's that's they say that mm-hmm. you know chimps tend to be more opportunistic but they call them right. there they refer to them there as more human because they only take what they need to eat you know they they mm-hmm. leave you know but orangutans tend to come in and and uh, they're more terrestrial not not necessarily you know tree based uh, they're more ground based right. creatures but they come in and they have no fear of people and they raid, and then they destroy the rest of the stuff that they're not going to eat, which is, you know... These creatures, too, it could be the various types, are going to have some different behavioral characteristics, I think. And as of this point, I don't really know, you know, what separates them, you know, which one is worse than the others, other than, you know, if you go by reports, if there's enough information that, you know, can help you identify which type... A particular it, individual, it have individuals to do are from, with their but, interaction with the locals, and you know how that went, and you know that sort of thing too. Because you know in Asia, you know the in their culture, uh, and even in India, you know they see these animals more godlike. You know they they do tend to treat them differently and things, but you know in Africa, not an example from India. I've talked to a couple of different guys. One of them is actually well, actually they're both JRG members now. One of them it has um, a working relationship with, you know, what they call Bollywood. He's uh, a New Zealander that lives in northern India and, and works with that uh, that business. So he has, you know, he knows a lot of the locals. He's been there a long time. And we were talking not long ago about the tiger population. He was telling me about the tiger population making a big comeback, uh, more so than people think and uh, about the uh, the indian military and their special forces and apparently their special forces are pretty good he says they're they're on par with ours probably trained by ours um but there are places you know they go they go in and take care of the poachers they take care of the poachers that kill tigers and everything so and they're pretty pretty relentless i guess and brutal so the locals when it comes to the yeti uh that's a whole different thing of course the locals you know human life isn't valued very high in india because there's so many people there a lot of people of course get taken by tigers and other other means of you know death but uh so it's not looked into very hard you know when somebody comes up missing and somebody says hey you know and a tiger got him or whoever but uh apparently when the yeti yetis take people a lot and they said that the locals are more fearful of the yeti by far than they are the tiger and the indian special forces won't go anywhere near the places where the yetis are but it I, I don't know about the vindictive part of that, you know, when it comes to, I mean, that's a, that's a feeding behavior, but there's more of an example that we know the Sasquatch has kind of a short temper. I mean, we can see that in lots and lots of reports, lots of stories. And I'm thinking of, of one, and I wish I, I interviewed the guy for the show a few years back. He was in North Carolina at the time, I believe it was. And he talked about uh, some of the local communities where he was working. And apparently for unknown reasons, one of these things was vindictively killing off livestock cows horses sheep pigs typically it would it would bite them through the back of the neck they break their spine and then leave them uh very close to the person's home almost like you know it wanted them to know that it was killing their livestock and tw tell us about the uh the picture you had with the, the dead sheep because I think oh, that's that a good goat? example. Yeah, that uh, yeah, that was right. in uh, South Central Texas. Uh, a lady sent me a picture 
uh, wanting to know if this was a, uh, a mountain lion kill. And, and the more we went over it, I said, you know, mountain lions, they're not going to kill something right there within eye shot of your house. It was like, it was just a couple hundred yards from the woman's house. And it was drug f- towards well, the, house. the house, right? Uh, and the, the left front leg was totally dislodged and, and dismembered from the body. Uh, the goat was dead. I mean, it was... It, it was graveyard dead, but and it was like within an eye shot of the of the house. So uh, yeah, that kind of reminded me of what the guy told me about in North Carolina because it wasn't particularly eating the animals. I mean, it did take some and eat them, but more often than not, it was simply killing livestock and leaving them where people would find yeah. them close by, almost to say, "Hey, I, I'm here. I'm doing this. Too bad." Pretty much, and there's. I mean, there's other stories out there uh, about vindictive behavior uh, uh, where a guy that was in the military, this is during Desert Storm time frame, had went to Desert Storm, and him and his and his grandfather were unknowingly habituating a troop of Bigfoot. Well, as, as he's off to war, his grandfather ends up having a heart attack going in the hospital. Well, by the time he got out of the hospital and got home... Are they apes, are they not? You know, we say to primates, well, we're primates, you know, by, by the definition of the word. So uh, if you look at what are the differences that, that separate us from great apes and chimps, you know, when it's already known that, you know, 97, 98 percent of our uh, mitochondrial DNA matches, there's only, what, a, a percent and a half left that's, that differs, there are still differences. So what... What we think we understand, based on on you know everybody that has this is anecdotal reporting, unless you've you know had one screaming at you in the night or you've seen one or come face to face with it, you know like T.W. Uh, I haven't. I don't know if I would call the benefit of seeing one myself yet, but <laughs> you know you've been screamed at though. <laughs> but I, I I can tell you I'm about to crap my pants when this thing was screaming at me, and I had a pretty good indication of what the heck it was. Uh, you know as it's stomping away and everything so you know i i don't i don't anybody that knows me knows that it doesn't i'm you don't have to convince me i know this is real you know this is uh you know uh, to a lot of people mythological creatures that they don't even want to get their mind around i think there's some very primal things going on inside themselves where we have a fear of monsters you know we we don't want to see things think about things walking around our house at night that could rip your arms off and beat you to death or, you know, break, break through the, you know, window and grab you out of your vehicle or whatever. And, you know, we don't want to think about those things. So we don't, we dismiss it. We put it in a box. But I think if you look at, at great apes and primates and chimps, and you look at at their morphology, uh, what makes them like they are and what makes us like we are, these, these fall squarely in between those two. I mean, they really do. Yeah, morphology is what what actually differentiates what different species are. In other words, if you take a look at the horse family, you know, you've got, you know, mules and zebras and all kinds of things that are different species, but they all fall within that same family. Same with primates. These guys, they have the same general makeup that all primates have, so that puts them, because it's based on morphology, squarely into the primate family. But I think when it comes to, there's a differentiation between um you know uh, anthropomorphism and comparative anthropology anthropomorphism you're right that's placing human emotions thoughts all these kinds of things on a non-human species whereas you know comparative anthropology looks at they say okay we've got this this creature over here that's not recognized but we're getting a lot of information a lot of these reports which you know tw is a police officer you know knows that that's trace evidence it is anecdotal but it's also trace evidence uh when you look what's in those accounts the behaviors and you take that information to look and see with other primate species let's say you know we the sasquatch someone said it did a b and c and you take a look at gorillas and we find that there is a b and c behavior there we look at chimps there's a b and c behavior I think it's fair to say at that point that's not anthropomorphism that's that's comparative anthropology because we can assume since multiple other primate species do a b and c and it was reported let's say multiple 
unrelated witnesses with the Sasquatch that A, B, and C was reported. I, th I think yeah. that's a reasonable comparison. Well, you know, anthropomorphism says, you know, this is why they're doing this, or, or interpreting something that, like, you know, we smile, we bare our teeth. You know, if they're showing their teeth, that's probably not a good thing. <laughs> right, you know? that's a challenge. <laughs> so, so that's the problem is, is how far we go with that and what our interpretations of those, that behavior is. And oftentimes people misinterpret. Uh, there's there's been a lot of um, things written about gifting and the problems with gifting, huh. and you mm -hmm. know they experience this with monkeys in uh, China uh, right now, where where you know it's become a habit for tourists to go up there and carry things. Bag burglar is what they call these monkeys now because they're very aggressive, so they'll they'll look cute and they'll do the begging gesture because they've been conditioned to do that, but then they steal. You know, so they go right to, okay, I'm close enough, and then they take whatever they can get. So, you know, where, where the, the real response for uh, that human interaction, which it probably shouldn't be anyway, but is to dominate, you know, is right. to show dominance and, and, you know, not offer anything. But, you know, so they're... Or shoo them away uh, or something, you know. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very fine line when people, you know, I hear about all these, you know, folks who, who these things are you know, passive and you know we don't have any problems right. with everything that subgroup you're dealing with may not right that's now. making an assumption exactly and and here's a here's a direct correlation and tw you can relate to this because you've actually had an experience with this with these uh these gentlemen that you've had contact with where uh -huh. and, and it's something that's said pretty often where when people leave things out for these things and then it stops they get very aggressive they get pissy. Which, they get pissy. So, Jay, that's something, you know, we've seen, like you've seen this, you read this about with the, uh, these monkeys in China, the Sasquatch, that's a comparative anthropology, you know, a direct correlation, you know, where we see what happens. And it's not 